John and I have been working together now for some time. And uh, we thought a good way to end this session was to talk a little bit about the projects that we work on and some of the things that we do uh, together as a research practitioner team. And in this way, we were hoping maybe to provide some ideas about how research does get translated into practice through partnerships. So we hope to end this, and a lot of it is also just to provide a summary of what we've talked about today. Um, as many of you can see, the folks speaking in front of you today are passionate about what we do and about what we believe in. Um, and, uh, and we hope we've conveyed that today to you. So uh, I want to get started. We're going to be sharing mics a little, or we're going to go back and forth a little bit on this presentation. So please bear with us a little bit. Can you hear me okay back there? Yes. Okay. All right, great. Um, I think much of evidence-based policing is about, as David likes to put it, coupling research and practice, bringing research and practice together figuring out how the craft of policing and research knowledge and tools can be used somehow or can be brought together in some way, can be coupled in some way. And the two things that we've talked about today, because I don't want to get off topic a little bit, I don't want you to go home with the, with the confusion. So I want to say that the two things we've talked about today are one, the use of research in practice, and secondly, the practice of research and practice. <laughs> the actual um, research is an activity within an agency. And those two things, in my view, hold uh, value to police agencies. But they also, there's a, a number of aspects of those two things that are different. Um, and they imply different issues and different challenges, as, as Professor Nostrowski brought up, um, in policing. But there's one, there's a couple things I want to remind everybody of so that w you, you take away from the session what we really wanted you to take away from. Uh, first, that, do you remember the 103 studies I first talked about in the evidence-based policing matrix? I started with that. I, I would like to point out that every single one of those studies, and this is really interesting, it's something I remind myself of, it's something I don't think about, but every single one of those studies reflects a partnership between a police agency and a researcher. Now granted, there are, there are bad stories in there, okay? There are stories of negativity, and there's stories of positive things as well, and there's ups and downs. There are people, there are researchers who have worked together for a long time with the same practitioner, and others who are banned from a, a police department, okay? <laughs> so there's a wide variety. <laughs> but, but I think what's interesting is the fact that 103 studies have been done partnering research and uh, practice together. And that is uh, a no small matter to take, uh, to take for granted. I think in the ideal situation, evidence-based policing requires this strong coupling. It requires this partnership, a consistent, strong, mutual relationship between researchers and practitioners a learning environment that has a feedback loop for both researchers and practitioners, for us to learn as well, and an institutionalization aspect, institutional aspect of each into the other. So it's not just about John's police agency institutionalizing research into their practice. It's about my academia, ac academia, is that the right word? My academic <laughs> environment um, incorporating practice into the things that we do, the things that we value, our tenure process, our promotions process, et cetera. Okay? So it's not just one or the other. And I think this is um, the ideal situation. Of course, there's challenges and bumps along the way. So John is going to uh, take over here. So we're going to give you kind of just a, a flavor of our relationship with Fairfax County Police Department and George Mason uh, to give you a sense of how we've dealt with this partnership. Uh, <laughs> yeah. John and I met each other for a long time. <laughs> okay. Talking about it, we actually, uh, the first time we worked together was after the uh, DC sniper case in 2002. Um, I, I worked in Montgomery County at the time. Welcome to some of the guys from th that I worked with uh, previously in Montgomery here. And um, uh, Montgomery, as you re recall, was the lead agency in, in that uh, event. And afterwards, there was, a, there was a desire to 
after that significant an event to learn something from it. How, there's good, that was a bonanza for all sorts of research to come out of how that case was, uh, was involved. Many of the agencies here actually present in this room were involved in that case to some extent, e even in an ancillary role, so it, it hits home. Well, at the time, uh, Dr. Weisberg uh, uh, was at the uh, uh, University of Maryland over in College Park. Cynthia was his top grad student, I think. And uh, we, uh, we were, uh, worked together as leads on follow-up research uh, following up that incident. Uh, on tip lines. On tip lines. Uh, that was the one area. Of, we, we covered a lot of areas, but the one area that Cynthia concentrated on out of that was the result of the whole tip line process, which actually did help solved that case, by the way, was a, was a tip. But there was the whole, how, the, how that whole tip line process worked, how that could be institutionalized, what were the best practices, and uh, a good product, the tip line uh, methodology was developed out of that research. So uh, since then, we, we've worked together. We uh, kind of lost touch for a while. When I retired from Montgomery at County at the end of 2005 and took my current job with Fairfax, um, then within about a year or so, when was it, 07 or whatever, that uh, Dr. Weisberg and Cynthia came over and started the Center at, uh, for Evidence-Based Crime Policy here at George Mason. My office is a mile up, up the road. Uh, when I read that they were over here now and had set up shop, I made a phone call. <laughs> I said, we got to talk again. <laughs> Come on over. Uh, because as part of my role as planning and research, uh, with the Fairfax County Police Department. Let's face it, I have a pretty large research staff, and, well, that's, it's me. Uh, <laughs> even with a large agency, I'm pretty much it. Uh, but to have the, you know, researchers of this caliber uh, down the, a mile down the road that I can reach out and touch and say, we need to know something, uh, I think that gives our department a huge advantage. Uh, it really does. Uh, that we can, you know, it, uh, one of the advantages of, of such a partnership is is the uh, force multiplication factor for those uh, in police work that need to do research. Uh, it's it's a huge advantage. Uh, since then, we've taught we've been involved in a number of um, projects that I'll discuss. I think our our first significant project was an NIJ sponsored uh, study of license plate recognition um, technology. Not so much the technology, but how it's used and how it's implemented. Uh, and that study, the, um, the LPR study, was published last spring, right, uh, of 10? There's a whole, for those of you interested, we have a whole LPR web portal now that gives a, a large number of information. It comes from the Home Office about license plate recognition uh, for command staff, um, uh, line officers, researchers, crime analysts, et cetera. And that was a project done um, by the center in conjunction with our agency and with uh, Hassan Aden's uh, group in Alexandria City. Uh, so that was a very successful project looking at the deployment and what is the best practice for deployment of, of license plate reader technology. Um, we've done, a, as part of that, we've done several um, unfunded graduate student projects. There's an opportunity there for uh, the, the graduate students at the center to work with our agency in, in the field to do projects really of interest to them and their, uh, their thesis and their career and so forth. Uh, one I will mention briefly, uh, Brianne Cave, who we met at the front registration desk on the way in, uh, did a study uh, in one of our uh, patrol districts, actually, Ted, and yours, <laughs> on, uh, uh, on cross-border interaction because uh, Mason District uh, uh, in our uh, jurisdiction borders about four other dist uh, districts in our jurisdiction plus two other or three other jurisdictions. Uh, there's a lot of, it's surrounded by border, <laughs> essentially. And how do police patrol officers interact and, and, and cooperate across the border to do police work uh, across jurisdictional and, and uh, internal boundaries to, uh, to do police work? Um, we're currently in the middle of an NIJ-sponsored technology project. Uh, within the last few years, our agency went through a huge technology upgrade with a whole brand new CAD, mobile data, and RMS system, all integrated within a short period of time. Um, we're studying now the, the effects on the agency of that uh, technology integration. 
what worked, what didn't work, how are we doing things differently now that we have that level of technology and different types of technology. Um, you know, we're working on uh, the uh, spon BJA sponsored matrix STEM administration project, which we're still waiting to hear on. Um, that actually there's several other, uh, some of the other agencies involved in that. There's several agencies uh, nationwide involved uh, partnering with that. Most of them are in this room somewhere and uh, that are going to be part of that. And we're doing uh, projects that are really kind of specific to our agency, whether it be hotspots. In our, in our jurisdiction, we're going to uh, focus on domestic violence and how we deal with that. Uh, so there's a lot of opportunity there. There's, as we say, there's a number of grant work, but one of the things is the, as we've talked about the last couple uh, of sessions, it's just that on opportunity for ongoing exchange. What's hot in the research world? What's of interest in the research world? Cynthia, her team can learn what's of interest to us. What's going on in our agency? We talk about that frequently, back and forth. What are you doing? What are we doing? What's, hot, what, what's of concern to you guys? What's keeping people awake at night? I think that um, in these exchanges, one thing that has led to a successful partnership is for us to be honest about what we each need. Um, sometimes this isn't um, discussed uh, as much as it should be, I think. And so some of the things that I want to bring up uh, as a summary today is just to think about, just to, for me to convey from the researcher's standpoint, what do we need? And John's gonna talk a little bit about what police agencies are looking for from researchers. And I just put a list for you to look at here. It's in your uh, workbooks that you have. But I think it's important to emphasize that often scholars are interested in actually learning about policing. I mean, this is, we have many questions uh, that we're interested in, in answering. And I think Steve's absolutely right. We cannot just ask all questions willy-nilly. We have to ask important questions and those that are relevant to police. But we're very much interested in learning about policing, uh, learning about the effectiveness of interventions. I mean, that the center is very concerned about do things work, do things harm, do things not have any effect whatsoever. So I, it's kind of interesting for us to understand that. Number three is really important. We're trying to train not only ourselves, but our students in how to carry out field research for the future. Evidence-based policing is not going to work if it just stops with me or with Professor Weisberg, we have young scholars that are, are that you, many of you that you met outside that are very much interested in field research and need to learn it. You'd be surprised that there are very few police scholars um, compared to other types of scholars like correctional scholars, etc. And I think it's important for us to train students to take on police scholarship. Uh, it, for me, ob obtaining practical meaning for everyday work is extremely important. And I think a number of scholars feel the same way. The uh, technology project that John mentioned to you, part of that is for us to try to understand what is the impact of te that technology has on policing. It's a very kind of theoretical question, but it's also meaningful when I do an LPR study with Fairfax Police Department. What, what is going to be the impact if LPR does in fact work and they have to adopt it, which costs $25,000 and is going to mean a change in the entire way they handle auto theft, uh, private information, cameras, et cetera. There's a lot that goes into that and finding that practical meaning is important. Um, oftentimes, uh, academics are, are motivated by a feeling that maybe we can help. Okay? And I think this is important just to say, because it, it might be Pollyannish, but it, in a sense, we're interested in reform in some ways. And, and I, I think that's something that should be said, because uh, we come at policing often with the notion of how can we also contribute to what you're trying to do in your agency as well. And finally, producing uh, products for our own advancement. This is something that, uh, again, we're often seeking research and publications and things just for uh, advancing in the field of academia. And these are often researcher needs that, uh, that come out when uh, partnering with agencies. What are some of the needs, uh, in other words, what's in it for the agency? What are some of the needs that we have that can be met through a research partnership? Uh, it's an opportunity to study and test the effectiveness of agency programs and initiatives. Chief Keene said it very well. There were some things he wanted to know. 
and there was a, there was a partnership opportunity for him to learn some of these things uh, to gain insight into the, the true best practices in policing. Uh, we tend to fall back in, in, as we do our research, to fall back on best practices. Uh, sometimes that's just uh, check with 10 other agencies and see what they're doing and you know whoever's doing the most, will, that's what we'll do. Uh, <laughs> the funny thing about best practices is, is they, uh, you know, some of, some of them are, are just, you know, some of them work, some of them don't work, some of them work in some places, some don't. Um, but overall, they're probably best practices for a good reason. I think the matrix is a good opportunity, a good tool for actually kind of dredging through that and maybe learning why certain practices may very well be best practices because they work consistently and they're replicable uh, and across a variety of environments. So uh, the matrix, I think, is, is very helpful in actually kind of figuring out what and why are not only what are best practices, but why they're best practices. Why do they actually work? Uh, to enhance research capacity, I touched on that earlier. It's a force multiplier for those of us in, in research and planning. Uh, to gain opportunities for career development for our staff, staff development. The, the opportunity to get some of our up and coming leaders and frontline officers, Renee, I think you touched on this, the fact to get more people involved in um, research opportunities, research studies, even to advance their own education uh, is great for them. It, and it's a win for the agency. In my mind, it's a key element in, re, in career development of your upper level staff. In the future, it should be. Um, overall, we need to continuously improve at our mission. We gotta get better. And sometimes that means really learning what it is we're doing, why we're doing it, how can we do it better. Uh, it only helps us in the end. Some of the challenges to agencies, and again, I'm going to, you know, I think the, I'm really kind of talking from my experience, but I think most agencies will say the same thing, and some, and some folks have said the same thing. Uh, Steve Mastrovsky touched on, on some of these in his presentation. Is there a tendency for institutional resistance to evaluation and change in our profession? Is there? Do we like the change? Do we like, do we like evaluation, especially outside evaluation? Do we like anybody telling us that we're not the best <laughs> in the world at what we do and can't possibly do better? Of course we don't. Uh, we hate that as an organization. Getting through organizational change, uh, resistance to evaluation and change is sometimes tough. You, some, you need champions. You need people, willing, leaders willing to take that step uh, and say, no, we, we need to do this. Um, I say distrust of academic research. Well, I would say until the lot, obviously not applying to anybody in this room, you wouldn't be here if you, if you didn't see the value. Uh, but I think you would agree that over the, until relatively the last, maybe the last decade or two in police work, there were many, many people in the profession who really did not trust academia at all or had very little experience themselves in the academic world. Many had never been to, in upper leadership, had never been to college themselves and uh, never really been exposed to an environment of academic research. A lot of distrust there. And again, a part of that was the sense, too, that uh, kind of the flip side of what Cynthia just touched on is the sense that academia may have, have a bit of an agenda, and it may not be a friendly agenda uh, to us in, in the law enforcement profession. There's concern about that that has to be overcome. There's a need, usually, in the law enforcement uh, in a law enforcement agency, when we need to know something, we need to know it relatively quick. We're on a totally different timetable than the academic world. We usually need it. We need answers down, dirty, quick, definitive. Uh, that kind of doesn't always describe <laughs> academic research. Let's face it; it's not quick, and it's not tends often not to be definitive. Uh, it usually comes up with more questions than answers. That doesn't always help us. Um, Research process may be somewhat disruptive to operations. Renee touched on this. There were some logistical challenges to doing the research project that you did. There are research, there are, it creates logistical issues with the agency. Trying to overlay research operations kind of on top of normal operations can sometimes be a challenge, can sometimes create issues, can, um, can sometimes enhance resistance. Police operate in a complex political and legal environment, and this is where some of the learning curve on the part of academia is. 
we operate in a complex political and legal environment. It's not always conducive to a pure research process, and that's been touched on several times. Uh, sometimes pure randomized controlled experiments are not really politically possible, <laughs> not in the way that it, it could really be done for, it should really be done for fidelity. Uh, sometimes we can't not staff a certain area for a certain period of time. Uh, politically, that, that's a no-go. Uh, so again, we have to sometimes balance that and find ways to conduct experiments in a way that meet everybody's needs and uh, address that. So that's some of the challenges from the police end, I think. I have to say that the first time I ever um, conducted a major randomized controlled experiment in the police agency was with John. And it, one thing I took away from that experience was how much resources had to be shifted by the chief to do our experiments. I mean, in, in just in pure monetary terms, resources are shifted to do our experiments. And, um, and it takes a lot of commitment uh, between, uh, especially by the agency to mm -hmm. do that. And um, I think the university, for those of us in the room who are researchers in the room, uh, 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 need to better understand that. I put some uh, challenges to universities here. The first one is more just a, a discussion for, my, for the academics in the room. There's really a lack of institutional rewards for this type of research. And, in um, uh, academia. Um, oftentimes, police research takes a longer time. It relies <coughs> on grant funding. And those aren't necessarily things that are rewarded uh, for promotion, for tenure, et cetera. Um, the, uh, and, it, and it just frankly takes longer um, to get there. I, uh, James and I have had a number of conversations about this. <laughs> um, field research is very time consuming, so sometimes unfunded. And it may not be meaningful to the agency. I say these things because these are things we're thinking about trying to change uh, as researchers, making research more meaningful. Um, often uh, we have a, a difficulty of maintaining the fidelity of studies. An officer might take a vacation or his wife has a baby, and then therefore you have to stop the experiment. Um, so this is an issue uh, that we encountered in LPR study, in the LPR study. And finally, expectations may not be met between both researchers and practitioners. But I, I want to stay positive because generally I think the, um, uh, the relationship is a positive one and it's absolutely necessary. The benefits to the university is, um, I cannot emphasize this enough. The knowledge that we need to perpetuate the university comes from this type of partnership, in my view. I don't know how else to emphasize that. The knowledge that we need to perpetuate this university comes from us having a partnership and from the knowledge that arises from it. It enters into our teaching, mentoring, research, outreach, skill generation, and the development of the criminological discipline more generally. So it is absolutely essential when we partner with you. Uh, so hence the reason why we speak it so often. Uh, we want, the, it helps with, it benefits the university by making a public contribution as well, especially for practice-oriented universities. It contributes directly to our philosophy and goals, and this is something uh, George Mason strives for. And it, we have also a financial benefit. When we do receive a research grant, it is something that benefits the generation of research uh, at the university and supports many of our staff and graduate students here. Some of the benefits to the agencies, some I touched on before. Uh, there is the opportunity to get some real answers to questions, and more and more there are the opportunities also there for quick feedback as, as we talk about building in kind of a, a immediate feedback mechanism into the research where, whereby as we're going along through the research project, if the, if the researchers see something that they can immediately kind of, that, they know it's going to go in the final report, but they can kind of give us that quick, hey, what you really need to know, what we see or what we think is this. Uh, you can build that in, in, and actually if it's something that would re might even require a little bit of tinkering or fixing on the part of the agency, um, we might have the opportunity to even correct that flaw or, or correct that problem and have that even kind of put into the research report. Um, so it shows receptivity on the part of the, the organization as well. Um, one thing that we struggle with, it was mentioned earlier, public surveys. 
uh, the university is going to do. The university has the resources, time, grad students, <laughs> capability, and the financing is usually roped into the uh, research grant. Uh, so that's all taken care of. We can get it done pretty inexpensively and kind of get those handful of questions into the survey that we really want to know and give us that feedback that we really need to use. So there's an opportunity there for to take care of a kind of a, a research mechanism that many of us want to do and need to do but really don't have the resources to do. The university partnership allows that. Uh, exposure for the agency, and I mean positive exposure. There's always, you know, everybody worries about negative exposure. But uh, think of the you know, the advantage to the reputation to your agency uh, when your agency is continually publicized in research publications and throughout the profession, everybody reads about you. <laughs> As many of the agencies in this room are read about a lot uh, from time to time, you know, in research ag uh, publications. That, that only, I think, really enhances your, uh, uh, your reputation as an organization, that you're willing to, you're learning a growing organization, you're developing organization, you're out there, you're doing research, you're getting better. Uh, and again, I mentioned earlier opportunities for members of the agency to be involved, to develop themselves, uh, to enhance their own skills and, and uh, their own career development. Uh, talk a little bit about some of the, uh, the best practices, if you will, about managing a good relationship. Um, one thing that we did uh, is complete and implement a memorandum of understanding uh, between our department and the center. Um, it, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about some of the elements of that and why we did it. it was good, it's a good idea to do. Um, it clarifies roles and, and so forth. Uh, makes some of the logistical challenges move a little smoother. Uh, de designate primary points of contact. Again, that's normally Cynthia and myself. Then we can sometimes sub-designate that uh, too. But it's good to know and, you know, but we're available if something is starting, if some hitches are starting to develop in a project, we can troubleshoot that. Usually a, a quick phone call and we've taken care of it. Um, start small and work up. Start with small, relatively small, contain limited studies. I wouldn't recommend the technology study as the start because that's really department-wide. But our LPR study, we really hooked up primarily with our auto theft unit to do that, to, uh, to do most of the work, field work on that. And um, so it kept it contained, relatively small number of people. It was very helpful. They worked very well together and uh, got it done. But keep your project scope small to start with early in, in a partnership. Work up to it. Communicate frequently. We do talk a lot, and it's very important. Keep the line of communication open. Um, get agency members involved. Get as many people as you can involved in a study and, and to be part of the study. And my uh, experience within uh, Fairfax has been people want to get involved. The enthusiasm among uh, employees, officers, and, and civilian employees who get involved in these studies, they really like it. Uh, it's a good opportunity for them. Be open, flexible, and generous. Be adaptable. <laughs> Try to hear each, each other's problems and, and, and adapt where you can. Meet each other halfway. Have to do that frequently. Some of the elements of, uh, of the memorandum of understanding are very important. Let me, let me say kind of right off the top. Professional researchers have, have codes of ethics. They have rules, regulations, ethical rules that they follow. They almost don't need a memo, a memo of understanding, but I think it's valuable probably to, for the agency, probably even more so than them, although there's value on both sides. Um, but it um, kind of provides that sense of comfort to those in the agency, particularly those who are resistant to research, to say, hey, we've got all the bases covered, you know. Oh, no, I don't want any data going out of, out of the, out of the uh, room. Well. Here's how they're going to handle the data. It's covered. This is a legal document. It's taken care of. Uh, not to worry. Uh, so we work through some of that. A statement of purpose. Why are, are you partnering? Okay. You should lay that out up front so everybody understands. Again, delineate roles and responsibilities. Who's going to do what? Have a procedure for selecting projects. You know, again, a lot of it's talking, but you know, you kind of have a mechanism to say, well, let's see, we could do this or this. What are we? What are we going to do? Um, very important to kind of have that. 
how do how do we get funding? That's usually built in. It, it's usually grant funding, and and there way we have ways of do, of doing that and mechanisms, and it works pretty well. The troubleshooting process. What if things are going wrong? What if problems are starting to crop up in the in the mechanisms? How do we resolve that? Uh, immediate feedback mechanisms I talked about where, where possible, and a confidentiality agreement because there are going to be times when the agency is going to be giving the research confidential information, data, and so forth. We have to make sure that's guarded and dealt with properly, and the MOU spells out how that's done.